Good evening, everyone. Here we are working our way through the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. We are in uh, chapter 4, stanza number 429, exactly right now. So, let's start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Dearest friend Swami Kriyananda, Humbly we bow to you all. Bless us with deep understanding that the words of this scripture may come alive in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirit so that we will be guided and blessed as countless before us have been guided and blessed by these immortal words of Krishna and by the clarity of understanding brought to us by Yogananda and his wonderful disciple Swamiji. We are your children. Guide us and bless us. Om. Peace. Amen. Okie doke. So, we are, I think we're reading number 429, but there was a whole big lot of the commentary that I didn't get to. So 428 and 429 go together, but we'll just start with the second one. One practice of yoga offers the incoming breath, prana, into the outgoing breath, apana, and the apana into the prana, thereby through pranayama, control of the energy, rendering breathing unnecessary. Oh, I love the way they just toss that in. (laughs) I mean, I know we talk about the breathless state and all that, but my, my. Somewhere in this commentary, which we haven't encountered yet, Swami talks about if you're a jivan mukta, how to deal with your remaining karma, karma and how to, to, how to dissolve your remaining karma. When I read that, I said to Swamiji, this is not going to apply to very many people. His response was, well, but those to whom it does apply will find it very useful. So what you're working with when you're working with scripture like this is you're working with um, levels of reality that the average person can also uh, can access, but then you're also, it, it, um, it's an ascending hill of understanding so that there's no point at which your realization will transcend the scripture <laughs> except God realization. You can keep taking it on to a deeper and deeper level. And just the, the statement, you know, that the ingoing, incoming and the outgoing breath, the inhalation and the exhalation, come together, and what's actually being said, they come together in the shashumna, and then we simply go past the physical. I've I've just been of late, just m- more somehow than before, before meaning before yesterday and today, um, appreciating the the extraordinary difference between ordinary human consciousness and divine consciousness. Not because I've slipped into divine consciousness, but there's been some um, intuitive appreciation for the implications of this whole path. Now, um, for me, this has always been thrilling. When I started on this path, which was actually when I was 20, when I met Swami at the age of 22, came to Ananda at 24. Um, I didn't know that 50 years later I would be saying things like, you know, I'm just beginning to really understand what this means. But that is among many powerful incentives for commitment on this path is the um, open-endedness of it. Someone asked Master, um, is there any end to evolution? He says, no, the, the human consciousness, the individual jiva. You keep on evolving until you reach endlessness. And that is, that's just really such a marvelous, there's no end because it ends in endlessness. 
So we're stepping into eternity. And the, uh, the, the richness of, of the path of self-realization is that no matter how far we move into it, it always marvelously opens out in front of us. It's sort of like, it's like walking through a valleys and narrow pathways and you keep turning and then you get a whole new vista, a whole meadow, a whole a river bank, a, a mountain range that you didn't know was there until you got around that bend. And then all of a sudden you're looking at something more expansive and more beautiful than you knew about because you had to come to that point before you knew it. Now some people could take this to be somewhat discouraging, but I, I've always felt just the opposite about it because, uh, well, I guess it, it just depends on, on your orientation, but it, it disappointed me when, when the full potential of something was revealed to me but the potential was limited. And perhaps I'm presumptuous, but I think it's more past life memories, because in this life, possibilities kept running out so fast. They just, they didn't, they just didn't provide the, the level of fulfillment my intuition knew was there. So the fact that this one just keeps opening up in front of me is a great, is a great friend to me. So just that simple statement, the ingoing and the outgoing breath, um, uh, come together, rendering breathing unnecessary. So just even that little thing, rendering breathing unnecessary, one doesn't lose consciousness and one doesn't lose one's life. That just there is a life that renders breathing unnecessary. Wonderful. So what Swami um, now talks about in this section, because this this particular um, sloka, this stanza, as I believe we talked about last week, is a, is a very direct reference to Kriya Yoga. And Swami, Kriya Yoga meaning, Kriya Yoga was the name given to an ancient technique, and this all sounds familiar to me, so I may have said this to you recently, is, is the name given to the specific technique of meditation that has become characteristic of this lineage not invented by this lineage, but merely embraced and taught by this lineage, because nobody can own the way the, um, the kundalini flows in the chakras. It's, just not, it's not a proprietary item, because everybody has chakras and everybody has a kundalini, and everybody breathes, and the way of awakening is the same for everyone. So different lineages can emphasize different aspects of it, but none of them can claim to own it in any possible way. And the word kriya simply means action. And in fact, many different lineages have their own kriyas, which means their own actions that help expand the consciousness. So um, Lahiri and Babaji, when they brought this into the modern age, it's notable that they chose a word that was a perfectly common word. Now, we, of course, in the West, don't know it's a common word, but it is a common word. And in fact, the word self-realization, which is the other word that, that Master decided to use in the West, is also a very common phrase. It was less known in the West, but not unknown. And it's widely known wherever self-realization is practiced because the word realization is the right definition of what happens. You don't, you don't acquire it. You simply recognize that which was always there. The word realize is a marvelous word because when you realize something, it, it, it's like it was always there for you to know. You just didn't realize it. You see how the English language works. And the self, with a capital S, which is the individual expression of spirit, the individual presence of God, self-realization means we just realize the self. We realize what's always been there. But once again, Master deliberately chose generic words, actually. And this actually got, you know, this actually was legally declared to be a generic term. And so is the word Kriya. However, 
and this is what Swami writes about in, in the commentary to, to this particular stanza, because it references Kriya, that doesn't mean, there because, therefore it's just called Kriya, therefore everybody has chakras, everybody has kundalini. That doesn't mean that it's a mundane subject that just um, anybody can talk about and anybody can do. Um, Swami references the fact that now that um, the printing press is widely available, and no, the printing press, from our perspective, has been available for a really long time. And in fact, we're beginning to change the printing press into the digital expression of things. Um, but from the point of view of the masters, uh, who, who work with a long um, sequence of planetary shifts and changes and rising and falling, now that the printing press is widely available, and the, the practice, the, the technique of Kriya Yoga can be explained in words, and has to be explained in words, is explained in words. Now, to be fair, it could be transferred entirely intuitively, but the common way that Master himself, the avatar himself, introduced the, the practice of Kriya was he explained it. He explained it in words. And we have a few recordings of, uh, have I ever heard Master explain the technique in words? I'm not sure. I've heard Master talk about it. But he did. He explained it in words so that people would know, you know, how to sit, how to breathe, how to concentrate, how to visualize, because those are all tangible things. All of that could be written in a book. If Kriya Yoga is such a tremendous help and the airplane route to God, as Master himself called it, um, why don't we just write it down and you know put it on placards and give it to the whole world? Well, Swamiji talks about this because there is another aspect um, that that ha- that hasn't. He's not talking about it yet in this stanza, but of course, Krishna talks about it elsewhere in the Bhagavad Gita, which is traditionally um, these kinds of esoteric practices are given through diksha, and diksha means initiation. That that there is more to a technique than just what words can convey. And this gets into this subtle issue of um, of the confusion, let's see, between the, the small s self and the large s self, and and what we habitually call the ego. The ego is the infinite spirit identified with the limitations that are primarily represented by the fact that we're in a physical body. But the fact that we're in a physical body immediately, and that we identify, that that our self-definition becomes connected to that physical body. Because if, if you think about it, and these are just fascinating things to contemplate. Once you have a physical body, all the potentials, once you have identified your life force with the physical body, all the, all, so many other possibilities, the infinite number of possibilities in creation, most of them are not accessible to us anymore. At least not our self-definition anymore. Because when you have one body, you don't have two. <laughs> And when you have one body, all of a sudden you have a mother and a father. And those, that, the heritage of that mother and father, their, um, the, gen- the genetic inclinations represented by the mother and the father, um, where you know the baby looks like the parents. And the baby always looks like the parents, at least somewhere or another. Even a very strong-minded individual, still you can tell this child's parents, you know, um, were African, these child's parents were Indian, these child's parents were Danish. I was very amused um, in, our, in our sangha for a period of time. There were two young women from Finland. They were very close in age. And if you had kind of like a, a characteristic picture of what a young woman from Finland would look like, they both looked exactly like that. And they looked a great deal like each other. And because they were similar in age, I mean, I didn't get them confused, but people would get them confused because they look so much like each other. And I, uh, I asked them, uh, one of the girls one day, 
I said, does everyone in Finland look like you and, and uh, the other gal? And they sort of looked at each other and said, yes, <laughs> like that. And it was, you know, this blonde and blue-eyed and certain look. It amuses me to realize that the chaos of our planet has now sent many refugees from um, even from African countries, from Mid-Eastern countries, into um, Scandinavia and into Finland. And for a generation, maybe, those uh, different uh, uh, ethnicities, cultural groups, will keep themselves separated. But slowly they will start intermingling. And then not everyone in Finland will look like my friends. Master made the interesting comment that um, basically the whole world would gradually turn um, brown-skinned. Not black-skinned, but brown, because all the races, will ingle, all the eth- uh, ethnic inclinations will all mingle. In Where I live in Silicon Valley, you see it happening. It's, it's, I don't know if it's more common to see a culturally mixed couple and, uh, or, or not, more common than not, but it's so common that you don't even think about it. It's just what's happening. And so all of those characteristics still. You will still bear only one set of characteristics. You will have only one gender. I know people are becoming very fluid in a lot of these things, but even the fluidity, there's still a limitation to it. I am a person... I'm not a puppy, you know. I'm not the birds that come to my bird feeder. I'm not as old as my mother was, was, you know. I'm older than my sibling. I forget how old I am, so every so often I ask my sister to remind me what the difference in our ages is, and she tells me that it's always the same. <laughs> if I could just hold the number in my mind, I would be able to know every time. <laughs> but I tend to just lose track. I don't know why. But because it's fixed, it's become fixed. And my body is getting older, and I I don't have the control like Babaji does to constantly renew it into youth. So all of these limitations have set in, and all of those limitations are a characteristic of what we call the ego, because the ego identifies with limitation. And I say it's not just being in a physical body, it's all of the multitude of definitions that come with that. I mean, it's so interesting to me just to think of the fact that when when my mother passed out of her physical body when she died, you know, um, was she still my mother? She was still herself, but now that she didn't have the body that created my physical body, I'm still in mine, but to hold her to the definition of being my mother, not not, I can hold her to the definition of being a beloved friend, and someone for whom I am deeply grateful. But it was her physical body and my physical body that gave us that particular relationship, which was actually a much smaller relationship than soul to soul. But the ego is so deeply steeped in this limited identification, and in order for us to offer the ingoing breath into the outgoing breath to such a point that breathing becomes unnecessary and that we can uh, know ourselves to be none of these limitations. The ego doesn't, by definition, it doesn't have the power to transcend itself. And the ego is what we're always working with. So what is necessary is a flow of inspiration that comes from, from the level that we are trying to move to by transcending the ego. This is a fundamental principle of Sanatana Dharma, is that for self-realization, a, a, a guru is necessary. And people can rebel against that if they want to rebel against it, but we have eons of wisdom that say there is a power that flows through the guru. And Swamiji even takes it a step further. And Master said, when Swami asked him, you know, when you are gone, will your power flow to your disciples the same as it does now? And Swami writes at great length in his commentary, one phys- a physical contact is necessary. And that doesn't mean that you have to have a contact with Master himself, if we're talking about this lineage, because even when Master was, was living... 
he had others initiate in his name. Swami Kriyananda initiated people into Kriya, but he initiated in Master's name. He was not acting as on his own. He was acting as an instrument for Master. But Master was able to give the touch of initiation through a disciple who was in tune with him. And Swamiji writes that that will continue. Now, that's esoteric in a sense, but there's also another aspect to it. And I'm, I'm extrapolating a little bit here and, and speculating to a certain extent, but also from conversations with Swamiji. It's that, why would we not seek out that direct connection? unless it comes to us in vision or it comes to us in a dream or a superconscious experience of some kind. But if we can have access to some living expression of the lineage that we're following, why would we not seek that out? And, and so what Swami is also talking about here is that there's a force of grace that comes into us. And And this is a mysterious experience that every sincere devotee can have who seeks to have this experience, which is, and this is the sort of, uh, the extraordinary mysterious beauty of Kriya Yoga practice, of discipleship itself, of, of spiritual development itself, which is we, as Swami puts it, we know that a great guest is coming And we, we, when, when, when an honored guest is coming to your house and they come to the front door, you open the door to bring them in. You, you, you participate in the welcoming and the bringing them in. But it's the coming of the guest that creates the atmosphere, that creates the living experience, that, that gives us the opportunity to, to be in the presence of and to know something that we wouldn't know otherwise. So our own deeply sincere desire to re receive this higher vibration and then to cooperate with, with the way grace flows. And you see, that's what offering the outgoing breath into the ingoing, the inhalation and the inhalation into the exhalation is is the esoterica of how grace flows. It's the doorway through which the honored guest is coming in, but it's the presence of the guest that transforms us. And so anyone who sincerely tries to attune and be an instrument for a divine energy that is beyond my ego self has this experience of something that enters and flows through you, that expresses through you, may express through your voice, through your eyes, through your heart, but isn't you. And it's so, it's so clear. It's like you read the philosophy and you're not sure what it means, but when you conduct the proper experiment, then you discover it. And Swami was so... Um, he was just so simple and emphatic on the point. People would say, um, a couple of days ago, this is being recorded in April 2021, and a couple of days ago was what we call Moksha Day, the day that Swami Kriyananda left his physical body. Uh, moksha means spiritual freedom. And so we were telling different stories and talking about Swami and One of the things that was shared was when Swami was asked once about what, what, you know, what is the accomplishment that pleases him the most? What of your many accomplishments you know, is the most meaningful to you? And Swami says, I don't feel like I've accomplished anything. Now Swami's writing this after he's been the author of 150 books. He's written more than 400 pieces of music. He's founded communities. He has thousands of hours of recorded lectures and it goes on and on. I mean, By any normal standard, his accomplishment was um, incredible in the, in the real sense of that word. It was hardly credible. So much so, interestingly, uh, Swami um, 
in, in the last year or two of his life, he was reading the history of what he believes to be was his own previous incarnation, which Al- was Alfonso X of Spain, who was the son of Ferdinand III. And Ferdinand III was believed to be an incarnation of Yogananda. And Swamiji, as he has done before, was, was master's son, physical son in that case, spiritual son in this life. And Alfonso X was also pr- prodigiously productive and creative in many different fields, including he wrote, I think it was like some 400 pieces of music, if I'm not mistaken, or at least it was multiple hundreds, many of them to Divine Mother. And so historians are speculating that he couldn't possibly have written all that music himself. He must have put his name on things that other people wrote. And Swami said, no, I wrote it all. <laughs> Meaning, as Alfonso X, he said, no, I wrote it all. So he wrote this document. And the document says, you know, later generations may think, and he wrote it, I, Swami Kriyananda, later generations may think that I didn't do all of this. I did. I did it all. And then he actually asked some of us to write um, uh, supporting depositions, supporting testimonials, explaining that we were there. We watched him. He did it all. A few of us, not as many people wrote as he invited to, but a few of us did. I wrote about the fact that Swami would send us his manuscripts. And I'm talking since like the 1970s. So this is like for all these decades. I'm in such a better position. People who arrive now, there was this girl... Uh, with us, and she was a, a very tiny girl. She wasn't really as small as this, but jokingly, Swami asked her if she'd read this book or that book, and she said, "Sir, you know, there's 150 of them." And and uh, the joke was <clears throat> that the Swami's book stacked up was taller than she was, <laughs> and I said I had the advantage of reading them one at a time as you wrote them over decades. But people who arrive at at the end are just faced with an almost overwhelming amount of material to over to to read so i read them one at a time and i talked about the fact that swami was in the habit of sending his manuscripts as he created them um, before they were published he would send a chapter at a time to a circle of people and he would do it to keep us connected to his inspiration and secondarily for our input he was usually pretty sure about what he'd done but but he listened whenever we had a a good idea. And occasionally he would write one with a question, what do you think about this? And we were always invited to comment. But it wasn't, what I'm trying to say is it wasn't that he relied on our comments, which was the whole point, which is what I wrote. He accepted our comments, but he never relied on them. And he never took them without integrating them into his own ideas. And I watched the books evolve. So yes, I know that they were all written there and so unlike that, it's smaller experience with the music, more with the books. But still, even all of that, so Swami wrote this document, which I have, you know, and he signed it. He said, I don't want historians to speculate that I didn't do it, and here's why, and this is why he wrote. It wasn't, quote, preserve his legacy or make him seem important. He said, every word I wrote was sincerely written as a disciple of Yogananda with the um, clear... Um, with the clarity of heart and mind that it was sincerely as he wanted me to write it. Because what he wanted us to know was this was the grace of his master flowing through him. And in other places he explained in more detail that's how he was able to do it. And then he would also try to explain to us that all of us could do what he was doing because it it wasn't an e- it wasn't the power of the ego that made it possible. It was, it was transcending the power of ego and therefore receiving the flow of grace that made his creative output possible. And he just didn't feel like he wrote them. Um, all of us who have attempted to do that and from time to time succeeded to a grace, greater or lesser extent understand exactly what he means. You might be the fingers that type it or the eyes that see it as you paint it or the voice that sings it, but it's not, it's that other self. It's the realization of the true self that really causes it to happen. And when we get 
into not just mere creative artistic expression, which if it's done to serve God, is as central to sadhana as meditation is. Service is fundamental to the spiritual path. Creative self-expression as an instrument of the divine is fundamental to spiritual attunement. But when we get into spiritual realization itself and, and the practice of Kriya, in order to practice Kriya correctly, and see this is where the subtlety of it comes, in order to practice it correctly, the, the correct practice includes the recognition of the need for a guru. So it's not like, oh, I'll just do Kriya, but I don't want to be a disciple. There is no such thing as Kriya. The other, if it's, then it's just a breathing exercise. Kriya itself, as the airplane route to the divine, is a recognition of the necessity to be in tune with the Guru and to seek out that flow of grace that, will, that continues to come through those who are in tune. I mean, think about Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Think about Padre Pio. Think about St. Francis, who was some centuries ago, but Padre Pio was yesterday. I mean, he lived, he died in the 80s, perhaps, 1980s. But he was exceedingly recent. Maybe he lived longer than that. I'm not certain. But he was very recent. And he, 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 he was a disciple of Christ. He was nothing but a, the, a clear window for the presence of Christ. And the presence of Christ was absolutely there. Padre Pio was very controversial because in the Catholic Church, of which he was a loyal you know, loyal spokesperson for that church. Um, all priests are ordained equally. And when, as Swamiji sort of wryly puts it, when one of turns out to be ordained a little more than the others, it becomes very inconvenient <laughs> because everyone wants to be involved with the more ordained priest. So even the priests themselves know they, they, they sort of, they try to shuffle them off to the side often. So they finally moved Padre Pio to some obscure um, rural part of Italy because he was an Italian priest. And of course, what happened is thousands of people found him there because that's just the way it works. But he was the touch of Christ for people. He was the living disciple. And those who were sincere rushed to receive that touch or rushed to any ordained priest, but they can run more deeply to one in which there is more of Christ and less of the small self showing. So that's a, all that is really important to contemplate. Okay, so let's go on to number 430. Some regulating the flow of energy in the body by correct diet offer all their energies into the fire of that upward flow. All the above seekers understand the meaning of self-offering, yagya or sacrifice, the inner fire which consumes all the seeds of karma. Well, Swami starts by explaining that when Krishna speaks of correct diet, he's talking about much more than just whether you have fruit smoothies and superfoods in the morning. Master, even though Master, um, well, let me phrase it differently. Master coined the phrase proper etarianism, which is because he saw that too many people substituted right diet for many things that were far more important on the spiritual path. In fact, uh, I, there was a conversation between Swami Kriyananda and an Indian teacher named Sant Kashavadas. This was probably happened in the 80s, 1980s in there. Sant Kashavadas has passed on to higher planes by this point. And the two men were talking about that this age, meaning early Dwapara, which is what we're in, this yuga, is simply too dense for mere physical purification to really liberate you from the clutches of maya. And they were talking that in, in the most elevated age, the height of Satya Yuga, for example, where the... Um, 
the material world is still the material world, as Swami emphatically told me once when I spoke too longingly of the a higher age. But the burden of physicality is not is not as heavy. And in such an age then, as they were saying, a little bit of physical purification creates a great deal of spiritual freedom. But in the world in which we're living in, physicality, the physical world, is just too dense. And so um, proper etarianism is definitely desirable because we are strongly influenced by what we consume. And when we consume heavy um, heavy energies, it makes our consciousness heavy. It doesn't help us. And so we all have discovered that what you eat matters. However, in this particular stanza, this is not about physical diet per se, because our diet is what we think about. Our diet is what we, what we look at. Our diet is the music that we hear. I mean, talking about, I'm not going to talk about the time in which Krishna said this, but the time in which we live. It, we, you know, we live in an age where the, um, the, we are absolutely inundated with, with input. You know, most of us who, if you live in a, in a rural environment, which is a great advantage, it can be a great advantage, where you're just surrounded by the natural world and by natural sounds, um, that is one a reality that you can understand. A friend of mine who was a very, um, he was a, 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 an independent sadhu type. But as soon as the weather allowed, he would spend as many months as he could in the high Himalayas. Uh, not Himalayas, the high Sierras in California. And he just had places, he would just spend months at a time just out in a purely natural environment where the thoughts of people and all of the stimulation just simply wasn't there. But I myself live, I live in a spiritual community. I live in an, a, a wonderful Ananda community. It's in the middle of Silicon Valley. I live in a, an ordinary house. I have, fortunately, because of where I live, I have trees and flowers out the window. But I live in the middle of one of the most energetic, dense, intense areas in the whole world. It's, it's constantly coming in. That doesn't even take into account the internet, which of course I use on a regular basis. I'm not cut off from modern realities. That's a choice, but it's not the choice that I live in. But every single time I go to that computer, I do have a choice about what I what, what my diet is. You know, do I scurry around to find out what every dictator in the world is doing and every politician is saying and every celebrity is interested in and every clever person has posted on YouTube. You know, it just, it's, uh, what, what's happening to us right now is we have a, a, a great, we're, we're transitioning from one yuga to the next. So we just, it's a tremendous intensification of energy without yet having, as a civilization, the collective discrimination to know what we should be listening to. And that's exactly what's happening in our whole country, and especially in the USA, where I live. We're just being absolutely inundated with ideas and opinions and, and urgencies and cataclysmic pred predictions and polarization of viewpoint. I mean, is that the diet we take in? You know, it's just, we, we, we are what we consume. As simple as that. So, he says, you know, regulating the flow of energy in the body, body meaning also the individuality, by correct diet. So, we just, we have to think about all these things. Um, and the word is, and then he says, the meaning of self-offering, yagya or sacrifice, the inner fire which consumes all the seeds of karma. Now, that is the essence of the spiritual path. It's, I, I, I've made references, I make references many times because I, it's, so, it's such an integral part of my way of thinking, which is reincarnation, the lives that have come before and however many lives there are still in front of me that I'm going to have to live through. I, it's, to me, it's not a theory, it's just a fact. In fact, it, in fact it's very interesting to me 
let me think how, how to say this. Um, once the idea of reincarnation and the seeds of karma and the necessity that they be consumed by the inner fire, that you have to be liberated from these seeds of karma by the inner fire, you know, many times the question comes, how do you, how can you, how do you become, how do you become so committed to the spiritual path that you won't wander from it? What, what thought forms, what behaviors, what experiences will actually be, are actually necessary as a guarantee for, for spiritual perseverance and therefore ultimately spiritual success? Success is guaranteed. We just have to persevere. And how, how long will that take? And how do we get ourselves through? Because those inner seeds of karma all have to be offered into the inner fire and all have to be um, transformed into freedom. Um, a friend, uh, an acquaintance, not a friend, was, uh, well, he's an, let me say it properly, he's not an acquaintance. I don't know him, even though I think of him as an acquaintance and a friend because I was so impressed. I've been so impressed by the work he did. Stephen Levine, who was an early pioneer in uh, end of life, end of life, um, ele- elevating the end of life, and this all came about, you know, at the same time that I was moving to Ananda in the seventies. That whole period of time when so much broke open, that was when Elizabeth Kubler Ross and Stephen Levine also were doing all this wonderful work to bring into mainstream understanding the whole process of death and dying. It just wasn't understood. Now it, you know, hospice is, is, uh, is, is central, and even near-death experiences and the tunnel of light and life review, all of that has become mainstream. But 50 years ago, it wasn't. So one of the things that Stephen Levine did is he ran um, workshops for people with terminal diagnoses to help them deal with the grief and everything that would be involved in that. I never have had such a thing, but I was very interested and I studied what he'd done. And at the, one of his seminars, when you, when you have a terminal diagnosis, and so now, I mean, everybody knows they're going to die, but if you have a terminal diagnosis, it's more than a theory. And you might even know if whether the doctor's accurate or not that you have six months or whatever it might be. I've never been in that position, so I, I don't know what it is. I've been with people who've been through this, and but it, it, it activates very interesting realities within you that I can see. So at the beginning of the seminar, a uh, weekend or week, whatever it would be, he would have you make a list of everything that you're going to not have to face. Um, no, excuse me, everything that you're going to miss because you're going to die. You know, and all of us have projected ourselves into the future. My son will get married, and I'll be at his wedding, and then he'll he'll have a grandson, and we'll be three generations of men together. And you know, you can see the whole thing. My beautiful daughter, and I will I will dance. I'll have the dance with her, and the mother of the bride. I mean, those are common, but there's many things. My son wants to be a doctor. I'll help him through medical school. And then all of a sudden, I won't get to see any of that because I'm going to die. Just none of that's going to happen. I won't grow old with my spouse. I'll never get that cabin by the lake, whatever it might be. It's a long list. And the heart, you know, grieves for all of those things. And after everybody goes through that, then he has you make a second list. And the second list is everything you get to avoid. All the difficult things that if you lived longer, you would have to face, now you don't have to face them. Maybe your finances are kind of a mess. Maybe you really don't like your job and you don't know what to do about it. Maybe you studied for a profession that took you years to accomplish and now that you're doing it, you don't like it at all. Maybe the person you married is not the person you really love the most. Maybe your child has some serious disabilities and you don't know how you're going to be able to deal with that. I mean, make a long list. And death is going to allow you to walk away from all of those. Now, yes, of course, the grief over the disappointment is important. But Stephen says 
perhaps more important, is what you're afraid of, that you now don't have to face that fear. And I was so interested in the whole thing that I sort of wrote down, you know, all the things that I might miss, and I, I experimented with that. Then I wrote down the things that I got to avoid. But what was so interesting was that list, I couldn't write that list. I could see the things that I wouldn't have to face, but always in my mind it said, in this lifetime. So there was no great relief. There was just no satisfaction in dying early because it would do me no good. It would just mean if, if I died with those fears in place and those issues unresolved, and God knows there were plenty of them. It wasn't like the, there was nothing on the list, but there was no escape because it was an inner seed of karma that, I had, that had to be burned up in the fire of realization. And if I was attached to it and I didn't really want to sacrifice it and I didn't really want to throw it into the fire, sooner or later, and if it's going to be sooner or later, there is no such thing as later, because when later comes, later is now. And for many of the things that I don't want to deal with now, it's because I refuse to deal with them then, (laughs) and this is later. This is it. There's no freedom except, well, he uses the word yagya, fire. There's no freedom except through the fire. And this is what we all have to come to realize. That's why he says, all of the above seekers understand the meaning of self-offering, yagya, that the inner fire which consumes all the seeds of karma. Now, seeds of karma are, um, it's, not, it's not just, um, it's, well, karma is unlearned lessons. Um, the common, in the, in the Bible, they use the word sin, um, but sin is it's kind of, it's, it, it's a hard word. I like to think of it simply as unlearned lessons. And everything, everything that you hold, that we hold on to, other than complete joy and surrender to God, is a lesson that we haven't learned yet. I mean, these are, these are big ideas. The Gita's, um, the Gita is not a beginner's text. And that's why it's lasted for all these mm, thousands of years, is because it goes all the way to endlessness. That every seed of karma, seed of karma is a, a vritti, is a vortex of energy stored in the chakras. And this is where offering the ingoing to the outgoing breath, having the to unite in the shashumna, opening the chakras, liberating the energy in the chakras. The chakras are whirlpools of energy. And those, that big whirlpool of energy is made up of countless smaller whirlpools, vrittis, in which there is some unlearned lesson. I, I must have this to be happy. I must avoid this. Um, I must avoid this to be happy. I must have this. I must avoid this to be happy. And a master has no likes and dislikes. You say it so simply, but it's uh, it's really big words. And all of those seeds of karma are why we keep coming back, have to keep coming back, why we have to reincarnate, is because we have unlearned lessons. We just have to face into whatever it is that I still think I have to either avoid or have in order to be happy, to have happiness. And yeah, it's impressive. And that's why, um, now, these lessons can be learned in different ways. Seeds of karma sprout, so to speak. And that's why we're born, that's why we're born into that particular family with that particular orientation that'll give us this particular body. You know, sometimes you see these extraordinary athletes and you think not only in this lifetime but how many lifetimes have they been driving toward this goal you know incarnating each time learning when children are born with so much natural talent in a certain direction 
I had no talents, what to speak of at all, except words. And, and, you know, in my family, I was the second child, and my brother is, was, was, is, as a, is a brilliant mind. Everybody in the family could read. I never remember learning to read. Both my parents were intellectual and my older brother. I never remember learning, but I, I just knew everybody was reading, so I was going to read. I mean, I, you know, I died reading and I was born reading. That's just sort of how the way it is. And I often joke that I, when I came out of the womb, you know, both, both, most babies cry, and presumably I did. But I s- assume as soon as I stopped crying, I started <laughs> telling my mother about the experience of being in the womb and then the birth. <laughs> because that's just, I put my experiences into words. That's just what I do. I was born doing it. I never learned to do it. I just was born doing it. Other children are born, you know, they play the piano or they, you know, they play an instrument. They're a prodigy and they paint. They, you know, they're incredibly coordinated athletically. You just see all these, or they sing, you know, they just, they can do things because we've been doing it before. So we just continue the story. It's something I, I need to have a certain experience because I need to work out this karma. So it, it, it takes, it sprouts from one lifetime to the next, or it sprouts within the lifetime. Just something comes up. You meet somebody. You, you, have, you instantly fall in love, or you inadvertently become a parent when you didn't plan to become a parent. But there you are. This is karma that has to be faced. You lose your job. You're in an accident. You become paralyzed. You know, just all kinds of things happen for one reason, so that we'll learn that these will under, we'll understand something we didn't understand. And a certain vritti of karma will then be dissolved. But a much more efficient way to do it, or, or let's say we, these things work in tandem, is that we, you can liberate those vrittis in the, in the chakras also by generating such a powerful flow of upward moving energy that all resisting energies are drawn into that. And that's the true yagya. That's the true sacrifice is that by my willpower and my concentration, I've withdrawn from every outer expression. And that's, of course, what meditation is. And I've concentrated my energy so powerfully at the, tr- the true fire. The outer fire is a symbol of the energy at the spiritual eye. And this is Kriya. Kriya is knowing how to, to interiorize the energy, to intensify the energy, and then to elevate the energy to the spiritual eye. And if you think of it, a vritti as a whirlpool, and you visualize a physical river, which is exactly what's going on in the spine, which is why these images are often used, the, a whirlpool, the, the river is flowing to the sea, and if uh, something obstructs the flow and creates a whirlpool, a rock, a tree, a pile of debris, whatever it might be, some of the water that's trying to go to the ocean gets sucked into this whirlpool and it's a, it continuously whirls. And it, it, it generates a tremendous amount of force, but there's no progress. It just continually goes like this. That's a vritti. And if the river suddenly becomes intensified in its power and the power of the river flowing to the ocean becomes greater then the force that's drawing water off into this whirlpool, then the whirlpool will be sacrificed for the river and consumed by the river. And it will simply cease to exist. It just ceases to exist. And then that much more of the water goes to the sea. Our life force, that's the river and the water, it's our life force. And we are committing a lot of our life force to hold on to, I must have this, I must avoid that. And so life force is trying to come to a a complete focus at the spiritual eye. And the spiritual eye is our individual self, um, um, our individual self definition becoming our attunement to the divine. And the medulla and the spiritual eye are the opposite poles of the same chakra. When our life force is 
is defined at the medulla, this defines our, our, our limited, our limitations. But when we move our self-definition from limitation to the infinite, that's just from the medulla to the spiritual eye. It's the same chakra. We don't even move it to another chakra. We just, who am I? We just ask the question, who am I? And we turn it. And when there's a tremendous amount of energy focus at the spiritual eye, all the rest of the chakras, it is increasing the flow of the river. And then the, the vrittis of karma are dissolved because our, we have realized a higher reality behind it, that I thought I wanted money, let's say, but what I really wanted is to be secure. And I realized that money is not the source of security. Security is in my relationship to God. So now I understand. And we learn that either by getting or losing money, (laughs) or we learn that by having the experience we were hoping to have through money, but having it directly, interiorly, by our deep experience of the divine. And so we have offered... Now, sacrifice, in this sense, doesn't mean deprivation. It means that we have, we have offered it and burned it up. We've given it to God. Oh, I don't need that money. That's not what I really wanted anyway. And the vritti disappears. And sometimes we know it. Sometimes we actually have a realization. And sometimes we just have an ever-increasing sense of freedom, and we don't even know why. Or a, a greater flow of energy, or a you know, just a a smoother run. You can see all these different words that all hold with the image. And we we don't have to know. Sometimes we know. Sometimes the the offering of these seeds of karma into the the yagya of realization um, is rocky. Sometimes the whirlpool dividing the rocks and the trees kind of smash around and make a little trouble. And sometimes they're just consumed effortlessly. But always, if we know that, that what's happening here, and this is what I was saying about, you know, what I am get to avoid, the karma has to be faced. Either has to be faced by intensif- intensification of inner awareness or by conscious um, awakening in a more external way, whatever it might be, it has to be faced. Whatever unlearned lesson, whatever vritti there is in there, sooner or later, has to be offered into the fire. Eventually, eventually, as as Lahiri said, why not now? Now, of course, if in this your faint heart fails you, then you just bring it back. And you can't always pray. You can't, you, you, you have, sometimes you have to pray to want to want to give it up. (laughs) <laughs> you can't always pray to, that it be taken away from you. Sometimes you have to say, Lord, there's no way I'm going to let go of this, so you're just going to have to walk me through it. Because you have to be sincere. You can't be something you're not. You know, yes, of course, eventually, Lord, all I want is you. But not yet. St. Augustine, one of the greatest of all the Christian saints, um, said he owes he was he was quite a libertine before he was augustine the saint apparently and he was quite attached to his libertine existence apparently his mother was also a saint saint monica i believe and saint monica just never stopped praying for her son and augustine said whatever you know realization he came to was all the result of his mother's prayers i often tell people that who despair of their offspring but saint augustine famously prayed All right, Lord, make me a saint, but not yet. (laughs) And that's sometimes what we have to say. But whatever we say, as long as it's sincere, Divine Mother receives it and will guide us accordingly. So, my friends, God bless you.